Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. We'll talk about the so-called sanctuary movement where churches shelter undocumented immigrants from deportation and a look at a unique system providing data on migrant deaths in the Sonoran Desert. Plus, in Sounds of Cultura, SOC, we'll tell you where you can see works of traditional and contemporary Mexican art. All this coming up straight ahead on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Three undocumented immigrants have taken sanctuary in churches this year in Arizona, and three churches have offered to provide shelter to four individuals. This revives a popular movement from the 1980s that sought to help Central American migrants fleeing civil wars stay in the U.S. by letting them live inside churches. Shadow Rock United Church of Christ in Phoenix was one of the churches that offered sanctuary to a man facing deportation this summer. Here to talk about this movement is Reverend Ken Heinzelman, Senior Minister with Shadow Rock United Church of Christ in Phoenix. Reverend Ken, thank you for joining us on Horizonte. Um, you made the offer, it hasn't been accepted because it, it turned out that what deportation proceedings were, were postponed? It, you know, what had happened is uh, it, it was really interesting that the day that those things were uh, to unfold where we were going to offer sanctuary, declare sanctuary, uh, there was uh, final negotiations between a legal team, uh, Marco Tulio and uh, uh, immigration officials. And uh, they, the immigration officials were able to uh, use uh, an administrative avenue that in fact would give uh, Marco a stay of removal so that he was able to stay with his job, stay with his family, stay in his neighborhood and, uh, and, and remain here. Uh, and this is something that he had applied for uh, two other times. He made application. He very much wanted to operate uh, 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 within the boundaries and uh, his application just was not even being accepted, let alone processed. So when his story uh, came to uh, various advocates, uh, they decided to uh, work on his behalf, but also knowing that, um, that uh, an order of deportation could happen, it, it could come, and so we offered sanctuary as a way to stand between a system that's broken, that would tear him away from his family, and, uh, and the unity of his family. So as a congregation, we stood, we stood in the gap. And, and you would have taken Marco Tulio and his family into the church and, and had him live on church grounds, is that right? That is right. We had, we had set up several rooms uh, where there were uh, uh, mattresses and uh, uh, sheets, and we were gonna provide food and dining facilities and ways for family and friends and also community groups to come in and for us to uh, uh, embrace each other and pray and, and, and hope for the best. Now, we made reference in the introduction to the 1980 sanctuary movement. Uh, Southside Presbyterian in Tucson was one of the churches involved, and I understand they're one of the churches involved at this time as well. Uh, to, to my knowledge, the legal question about whether churches can actually do this and stay within the law has not been resolved. Uh, that's, that's my understanding as well, that uh, uh, it's, it has not been resolved. and. Well, first of all, to Southside Presbyterian and to Reverend Allison Harrington and to that congregation for providing leadership, we want to say thank you to, to them. But in terms of, you know, does sanctuary really do anything in terms of does it keep law enforcement from coming into the church and taking uh, the person and, and executing the orders that, the, that they have to deport a person? Uh, it's, it certainly doesn't. The sanctuary has no legal uh, status. Uh, it, is, it is a moral stand, uh, it is one of compassion, it is one of, of justice and what is best uh, for these individuals and for these families and ultimately really we believe what's best for our community. So if, if legal authorities had come to the church, let's say Marco had taken sanctuary in, in South High, in, in uh, rather a Shadow Rock Presbyterian, your church, and if legal authorities had come seeking his to arrest him, would you in any way have physically prevented them from doing so, either by locking the church doors or in some other way denying them access? 
I, I don't think we would have locked any church doors. I think that there would have been several of us that simply would have, would have stood um, uh, passively between the officials and the family and uh, uh, to, to literally, uh, physically stand with the family. They would have had to, uh, um, I don't know what they would do. That would be up to them. Now, some people draw a distinction between what happened in the 80s and what the churches are doing now, and, and the distinction they draw is that those people were subject to death, persecution, if they were returned to, in that case, El Salvador, which is where many of the, the migrants were coming from. Marco Tulio's from Mexico, uh, and the consequences of, of returning them to Mexico, uh, many would argue, are not the same, and therefore, these efforts are not justified. How do you respond to that? I think that, uh, Historically, uh, politically, there probably uh, there are some differences, uh, and I wouldn't wouldn't disagree with that. But I think that the church's response, uh, one based on what is just and what is uh, most fair, what is most compassionate for uh, the individuals that are most adversely affected by a, a system's decision and a system's uh, policy procedures. Um, uh, the church's response to, to that is pr pretty much the same. It comes from uh, understanding that um, um, we as human beings, we are uh, loving our neighbor and loving other human beings. And uh, uh, while the suffering uh, may be different, it's still suffering and it's still an injustice that we need to stand against. One last question. Um, a lot of discussion in the news this week about President, Obama, uh, President Obama's decision to um, not take executive action at this time as regards immigration. We're not sure exactly what he would have done anyway, but, but there was a suggestion that he made uh, some time ago that in the face of congressional inaction, he would do something. Um, to at least minimize the number of deportations. How much of a factor uh, would that play going forward in, in your church's decision to extend sanctuary to others who might be facing deportation? I'd, I really don't think it's gonna be much of a factor in terms of our decision of how we respond to the need of, of families and the need of our neighbor. I think that, uh, uh, you know, there's, I think there are some misunderstandings, um, you know, that, that somehow as a church we're breaking the law or we are in a, a, an act of civil disobedience. I would say that we're more in an act of cultural disobedience in that the, the culture is, is not in a friendly to immigration. Um, that the truth is, is that um, uh, immigration has administrative avenues already has been, for example, with Marco Tulio, the day that he was to come in for sanctuary, an administrative decision was made to give him a stay of removal so that he could return to his family, return to his work. So the tools are already there. We're not acting in civil disobedience. We're asking that immigration use the policy and procedure that they have. Now, can President Obama do more? Yes. Has he hesitated for political reason? It seems so. Uh, are we disappointed in that? And are families greatly affected by that delay? Yes, they are. And on, on that note of, of disappointment, which, which I know many share, um, uh, we're gonna have to end the interview. We're out of time, but thank you for joining us on Horizonte to talk about sanctuary thank movement, you. at least the, the 20, 21st century version of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. The Pima County Medical Examiner's Office has a tool to help law enforcement and the public access data on the many migrant deaths in the Sonoran Desert. AZPM's Fernanda Echavari has the story. Since January of 2001, more than 2,100 bodies categorized as undocumented migrants have been found within the jurisdiction of the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner. Now most of those deaths are recorded on a website that maps out the data. When you go to the general search map, say the map of migrant mortality again, you know... Gregory Hess is the chief medical examiner for Pima County. 
He says the online database has been in the making for eight years, and there is nothing else like it in the U.S. And then here in southern Arizona, it's a unique population because we're interested in migrant deaths because we've been the primary location for um, migrant deaths of people crossing from uh, Mexico into the United States uh, you know, for probably the last uh, 12, 13 years. For categorization purposes, the Office of the Medical Examiner uses the term migrant for someone who was actively in the process of crossing the Sonoran Desert most of the times on foot. Hez says the method is not perfect, but in thousands of cases, only a couple of the bodies have turned out not to be migrants. In some instances, we don't know for sure if, when we find remains if they are not a U.S. citizen or they're not a Native American from the Tohono O'odham Nation, but based on the effects that they have with them uh, or the circumstances where they're found, you know, the assumption is that it's consistent with somebody that is migrating in the United States across the desert. And most of the time when we do identify people, it turns out we're right. He says the $175,000 project was funded by an anonymous donor. The medical examiner's office and the nonprofit organization Humane Borders are working together on the website, which will be updated quarterly. The, until the money runs out and then we'll have to look for another fund. It's hard to make policy decisions if you don't know where people are dying. So having a uh, spatial representation of where that is can be helpful for that purpose. The website, humaneborders.info, has numbers that go back to 2001. Visitors can narrow down the search by a person's name, gender, cause of death, year of death, or where the body was found. Hess says most deaths are by exposure to natural elements. Essentially, if the, if the bodies we receive are decomposed to the point where we can't do a full examination, um, we don't know why they died. But of the people that we can do a full examination, the majority of them have died from environmental causes, either hyperthermia being too hot or hypothermia being too cold, uh, plus or minus dehydration. And we lump all that into a category we call exposure or exposure to the elements. He says the online tool will help the medical examiner's staff. We find remains uh, spread in part by time. So we may find a, uh, a left femur or a left bone from the leg in 2005 in a particular area of the desert. And then a couple of years later, we get a report of uh, a skeletal remains found, and maybe it's a right femur and a pelvis and a skull. And we think, well, these are fragmented or incomplete remains. Is it possible we recovered portions of this individual earlier in time? We can use this database to uh, search around uh, a radius from where those remains are found and pull up all the remains that we've recovered from 2001 on with an X distance and say, oh, this, this could be the same individual. This is really fresh. The website is also designed to help anthropologists, researchers, and humanitarian aid groups like Humane Borders, who can use the information to map out where to put water stations. Hez says the information can also be used by law enforcement agencies who can use the data to track patterns in trafficking and deaths. If you're the sheriff's department, you know, it might help with uh, staffing. If you have a small, like in Ajo, Arizona, which is a far west uh, portion of the county, you know, how many deaths are out there versus on the Tohono O'odham Nation? Um, what kind of vehicles do you need? Is it accessible by roadway or do you need an ATV or do you need a helicopter? People looking for missing family members can access the online mapping system from anywhere in the world, and parts of the site are in Spanish. This will allow somebody to look at a geographic area, pull up all the remains that were found, have a description of those remains, um, and see if it's consistent with the person that we're looking for, or if somebody needs to go look, or if there's some, you know, something else that needs to be done. So essentially, this is a, this is a male. We don't know who it is, that's why it says John Doe. Many hope that by having information available online, the hundreds of nameless remains of migrants, mostly from Mexico and Central America, can be identified. In Sounds of Cultura, SOC, 
The Echo a Mano exhibition is a collaboration between Calaca and Willow North Gallery showcasing works of traditional and contemporary art. Here to talk about it is Marco Alvaran, director of the Calaca Cultural Center, and Genaro Garcia, one of the artists whose work is featured in the exhibition. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us on Horizonte. Echo a Mano, Made by Hand, is a reference to, to Mexican folk art. Um, uh, and, and, and what the exhibition does, as I understand, is it's really a combination of, of traditional Mexican folk art, contemporary, and then kind of the new generation and, and, and the, the artists who span that gap between Mexico and Arizona. Give us a few more details. Yeah, the, the idea of the, uh, of the exhibition was primarily that. It, it was to connect what, uh, how our roots as artists has been in Mexico and then how it's been transcended into, into the United States and what the artists right now are creating, which is more of the contemporary version of what has been created in Mexico. And the featured artist is a Mexican artist, is that the right? The featured artist is a Mexican artist. He's from uh, Oaxaca, Luis Pablo, and, and, uh, and uh, I mean, he's, he's already up there in terms of uh, his statue as an artist. We're gonna show a few of his pieces as, as we're talking. He comes from a tradition um, of, of um, Carvers, wood carvers, and right. the, the the styles or the references are to alebrijes right. in, in, in in Mexico, um, and and this is um, a somewhat typical piece, I would say, of, of that style of, of uh, handiwork. Right, it's it's very typical. Uh, actually, many of these artists have creating uh, an, uh, uh, animals that are not really realistic. That the, actually they're almost like a dream. Mm -hmm. Somewhat fantastical, figures. right? Fantastical yeah. animals. So, so it, it is very, very, uh, uh, you know, similar to what other artists are creating, actually. And this is another one, jaguar, which is a, a very popular image, in, right? In, in these types of works. Yeah, uh, 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 one of the things that he created is basically kind of uh, 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 focusing on what the South Mexico is, and, and because Oaxaca is very similar to, I mean, where m many of these jungles are, uh, but. But again, he is, 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 is in a way is creating a, a, a fantastical animal that, that in terms of the colors and how it is, that is not in existence. And both of these pieces are in the exhibition. Uh, the jaguar is in the exhibition. The other one is, is one of his pieces that he created. There's, I have uh, a few of his pieces actually in there. They're, they're uh, uh, not in, in the samples that I brought over here. And I think we have one, one other picture that we, we want to show. This is what what would be an eagle or, or no, actually. It's a condor. Condor. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, again, it's one of those uh, pieces that, that uh, I think he probably got influence from uh, uh, South America. And, and he is a, a, an artist of, of world renown at this point in time. Right. Uh, he's, uh, recently, he's, he was invited to Sweden. Uh, he's been to Europe, uh, uh, South America. Uh, he in the United States, he travels constantly. Uh, so he is, he's one of those artists that, uh, from Mexico that has got the support basically from the world community and what he's creating. Now you're featuring the, wor featuring the work of, a, of an ar artist who is, is from Mexico, Genaro, um, uh, who, who kind of crosses the two cultures because you were, you were born in Mexico, mm -hmm. you, you uh, live here now, you, you exhibit a lot here, but at the same time, you've, you've been going back to your roots, literally. Yes, um, yes. Studying there and, and doing things. And, and we've got one of your pieces that, that's in the exhibition that, that we want to show mm -hmm. uh, on camera right now. Um, describe this piece to us, Senado. Well, it's a typical tree of life uh, uh, with the Virgen of Guadalupe in the middle. Um, the influence is totally uh, from Latin America. In my case, this piece is more Mexican than anything else. Uh, I started doing the tree of life when my daughter was born. The first piece that I did was hand painted. Uh, uh, it was uh, oil over Italian plaster on canvas. And I keep doing uh, uh, the tree of life. We start doing the um, tree of life in, in wood carving with the idea uh, of the typical tree of life in Mexico that they're made of clay. And it's an amazing work that, that people uh, uh, from Mexico does with the, with the clay. But because my dad and I, we work with, with wood we wanted to do our own interpretation of the tree of life. And that's how we came the idea of, of doing it with, uh, on wood. And we've got a picture of you with your dad on, on one of your bigger pieces. It's actually about the same height that the two of you are. We're gonna put that up on the screen. The bigger is like six feet tall. Uh, that piece, if you see, is cut in half uh, with a mariachi in both sides. And that piece is at the, at the airport uh, here in Phoenix. 
at the, at the Barrio Café restaurant. Uh, it was a, a commission from Chef Silvana uh, to have it on the bar in, in each side of the bar. There's one side of each uh, of the Tree of Life. And, and what is, you know, we talked to, to Marco uh, about the, the, the connections to Mexico. Um, and you mentioned one of them is, is the Tree of Life. Mexico, it would be in, in clay. Here you're doing it in wood. But it's still kind of the traditional mm -hmm. image. Um, what other influences? We've got some other artists in, in the exhibition here. Uh, what other uh, works, and, and this is a question really for you, Marco, uh, represent that transition between Mexico and, and, and the United States? Uh, we have one artist actually that uh, right now that uh, he's from Chihuahua, and, uh, uh, and, and he's creating this, this wonderful pieces of rock, carved rock, uh, Rigo Martinez. And uh, uh, we also have uh, Martin uh, Moreno, which is from, from Chihuahua, I mean from uh, Mi uh, Michigan. And at and, and, and the same time, as, as you can see the transition from what has been created in Mexico with the carved rocks and what he's creating. Because one of his pieces that he has there is actually uh, made with uh, 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 middle rock, basically. And um, so you can see the difference between one and the other. Um, we have videos from some of the artists that are from Mexico that are creating actually in there, are creating uh, their pieces for the ceremonies going on in Mexico. So it's that, that direct connection actually that, that we have in the exhibition from, from the culture in Mexico to how, how the influence have gone all the way to uh, Chicano culture. Now, Hinata, we have a, a couple more of your pieces that we would want to put up on the screen mm -hmm. that represent some of, of these issues and, and transitions that we're talking about. And, and this one literally captures the, the migrant experience. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about what you're trying to do with this piece here. Well, that was the first thing that I saw when I came to U.S. 15 years ago. Uh, the first time that I went to California, uh, uh, I saw that sign on... on, on, and, on and these are the signs along the road. Exactly, uh, on the basically freeway. Basically, people crossing. Yeah, saying, like, be careful, there's people crossing. And you see, it's a, it's a family. It's an immigrant family running. And that sign is like, for you to be careful when you're driving because there's family that can be just crossing the, 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 the road in front of you. So that's, uh, uh, that's my, my interpretation of that sign of what is or life coming to, to US. That's the way I came to US. And, and, and for me, that piece represents uh, a family that want to offer something better in, in, in life for, for, for themselves. And what about the issue of, of immigration legal versus illegal? What are you trying to say about that? Hmm. For me, no, there's no, there's no uh, immigration illegal, to tell you the truth. I came, I came when I came to US uh, 15 years ago, I was homeless, sleeping in the on the street, but I came to, to do something better for my life and to offer something good to this country. And, and every day uh, we fight for that in, in, here in the U.S. We're trying to give something to this country, and that's what we're doing. We do it with art. We do it uh, being uh, a good father, in my case, a good, uh, a good husband. And that's what I give back for being here. For, so for me, uh, the word illegal, it doesn't exist. I want to come back to, to uh, that image in, in a moment. But Marco, you also have some, some U.S.-born artists. Mm -hmm. uh, Reggie Casillas is, mm -hmm. is one of Martin Moreno's son. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and tell us about uh, the importance of including their work in this exhibition. I think it's very important because, I, I mean, that's one way of actually uh, linking one from the other one. And there's, and there's uh, uh, with the art, you can see that there's no actually much difference. It's just the styles that, that has been the experiences that we have uh, through living here or going through the border or still living in Mexico. It's just that, it experience. But the art itself is, is basically embodies the connection that we have with one or the other one. And the exhibition actually opened last week. Uh, uh, what, right. How long is it going to be up on this? It's going to be until the 23rd of this month. And, and uh, our second grand opening is on the 19th, which is the f first, uh, third Friday of this month. So uh, I invite all the community to go over there. And, and physically, where's, what's the location? What's the address? It's, it's, uh, it's in between, actually, uh, uh, Thomas and, and 7th Avenue. 
And I think the address is, is going to be unprompted the, uh, uh, with the information. We'll show it on the screen. Right. Um, uh, we've got about 40 seconds left, maybe even less than that. One last image we want to put up on the screen, um, illustrating your work. This, is, this looks like a, a kind of an Adam and Eve figure as well. Um, and, and we talked about it, it's, it's kind of in white. Tell us about that. Uh, it's a, also, it's a tree of life. In, in this case, it's uh, Adam and Eva. Uh, the beginning of uh -huh. yes. sorry <laughs> so and a lot of people uh, question uh, ask me about why it's all white instead of the typical other tree of life that, that we have that they're full of colors and bright is because with the idea that Adam and Eve at the beginning was everything was pure everything was uh, pure so that's why the color white and at the same time for me white represent a little bit of uh, uh, Elegante. It's a, it's a it's a it's it's a elegant color. And and they'll be able to see elegant stuff as well in, in the exhibition. I'm sorry, but we're out of time. So thank you both for joining us. And and thank that you. is our show for tonight. From all of us here at Horizonte, thank you for joining us. I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.